Welcome to the Localization Fireside Chat. I'm Robin Ayoub, your host. Join me for captivating conversations with industry leaders exploring localization, translation, and global communication. Ignite your curiosity as we expand your horizons through these conversations. So let's dive in together into the Localization Fireside Chat. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to another episode of the Localization Fireside Chat. My name is Robin Ayoub, and I'm coming to you today from sunny Marbella, Spain, where my family and I are spending some days on holidays here. And with me this morning, I'm honored to have as a friend to this channel and as a guest, which I got to know a little recently, Mr. Paul Doherty. Paul is in England, and Paul... I consider you one of the building blocks, if you will, of this industry. After I've read your CV and I've read your bio, very, very interesting individual and what you've accomplished for the industry, what you've accomplished for yourself, etc. So building two companies, making them a building blocks of Xerox and Linebridge down the road, worked with major industry companies, and now you run your own private consultancy company, which you know you bring your expertise to whoever they need them. And I will let you, if you don't mind, Paul, welcome. Welcome again. Hopefully, hopefully you're okay you. with me to chat with another 40 minutes. This conversation at least will take us about 40 minutes. So if you don't mind, as we say on this channel, Paul, everybody has a story. So yeah. you must have some interesting stories. How, it does, how does that play out for you? What's your story and how did you get into the industry? Well, uh, hi, Robin. I'm delighted to be here. I'm looking forward to our chat. Well, I know you you ask lots of guests about uh, how they get into the industry, and the short answer would be completely by accident. But since this is a chat, I've got a longer story. And a lot of people focus on what they did in their personal story and how they get into the localization industry. And that's important, and I've got a story to tell about that. But for me, there are two big political events that happened that, that gave me and a lot of other people a career. And the first one was the 1944 Education Act in the UK, which extended education from the age of 14, free education from 14 to 18. And then if you were good enough to get into university, into university as well. And so, for example, my father was born in 1913. My mother was born in 1916. They were both intelligent people. My father passed an entrance exam for St. Mungo's Academy in Glasgow in 1927, but his father couldn't afford the fees. So my father went in at the age of 14, went into the Glasgow shipyards, and he was still working there in 1972 when he died. My mother, she loved literature, and when we were children, she would recite Shakespeare's soliloquies from Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth, Julius Caesar, which she remembered from school. And when she she died at 92 of a stroke, and with the stroke that, that killed her, she, when she was she was rereading George Eliot's Middle March for the umpteenth time. So, but no matter, she had to finish school at 14, and she went into an armaments factory during the Second World War in Glasgow until she met my father, and they had six sons, and I'm one of them. But the 1944 Education Act meant that me and my brothers weren't condemned to follow that path into factories or shipyards. So we went to university. And my brother Hugh, he became a civil engineer, worked on the underground in Hong Kong, the mass transit expansion in Singapore, the Jubilee Line extension in London, and the new Elizabeth Line in London. My brother Eddie was helped to manage the fiber optics rollout for British Telecom in the UK. My brother Stephen became a trade unionist. My brother Jared went to the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama, became a violinist in the Scottish National Orchestra, and he's now a conductor. And my young brother John went to Glasgow School of Art, became an art teacher in the Middle East and in Hong Kong. And these were all firsts for, for my family, but my family wasn't exceptional. I mean, if I think of just the school I went to in the south side of Glasgow and the people I know just from that one school. So Peter Lawwell, who I used to play football with, he became... CEO of Glasgow Celtic Football Club, the best football club in the world, of course. And uh, Mick McNeil, he became the keyboard player for Simple Minds, which was a big band in the 80s. Donnie McFadden, he's a, a VP at Apple out in California. Shirley Bennett became an IBM executive in North Carolina. Mick McKenna became a stand-up comedian. Ronnie Ryan went to Edinburgh School. He's an artist in Scotland. And my mate Pat Lanigan became an actor in Berlin. And these, these are just 
kind of typical example. So that 1944 Education Act opened up a door of opportunity and we all walked through it. And <clears throat> the second thing was Britain joining the what became the European Union in 1973, which gave freedom of movement. So you could go and live and work in any member country with the same rights as anyone who's a national of that country. So I graduated in 1980 with a degree in philosophy. So what are you going to do with that? I didn't know, but I just knew I wanted out of Glasgow. I wanted to, to go and live abroad, experience foreign cultures, learn foreign languages. So I left, I bought an interrail ticket. I'd saved up £60 from working in a pub in Glasgow. And I left on October the 6th, 1980. And my very good friend, one of my good friends, he said to me the day I left, see you in two weeks. You know, that's how supportive friends and family can sometimes be. So I, I left for, for, for Germany and I was heading for Berlin. And one Sunday evening, the train pulled into Darmstadt and it was very late on a Sunday. And I thought, I'll never get to Berlin tonight. So I thought, I'll try my luck in Darmstadt. So Sunday evening, Monday morning, nine o'clock, I went to the Arbeitsamt, the unemployment office in Darmstadt. And I said, do you have a job for me? And they said, yes, no visas, no employer sponsorship, no waiting time, no, just yes. That's freedom of movement. And because I couldn't speak German at the time, they said, well, go to the, the US Army, they're looking for laborers. So I went, I got an interview and I got a job as a laborer for the US Army. So I had a job, then I had to find a place to stay. So I went to Darmstadt Technical University and said, hey, I'm a student. I didn't say I'm a graduate student from Glasgow, I just said I'm a student, I'm looking for somewhere to stay. And they said, well, go and see Pharrell Rosenstock. She likes foreigners. So I went to see Pharrell <laughs> Rosenstock and she gave me a room. So I had a place to stay in the room. But I had a problem. The £60 I left Glasgow with, it was almost gone. And the US Army was going to give me a salary in one month. And I couldn't live for a month on no money. So they told me, you have to open a bank account anyway. So I decided I was going to open a bank account with a bank that would give me an advance on my first salary of 400 Deutschmarks. There was no euros in those days. So I went to the centre of Darmstadt, Louisenplatz, big square in Darmstadt, Friday afternoon. And in the corner, I saw there was a Sparkasse, one of the one of the German Germany's banks. And I went into this bank and it was a big lobby full of people. And, you know, lots of tellers and lines and lines of people queuing for the teller. And I thought, if I stand in one of these queues, I'm going to be waiting there for 45 minutes to an hour. I'm going to get to the teller window and speak English with a guy who probably doesn't understand English. And I'm going to say, can you give me some money till next month? And they were going to tell me to take a hike. So I thought, that's not going to work. I have to talk to the bank manager. So I thought, well, where is the bank manager? So at the far end of the bank lobby, I saw there was two elevators, two lifts, right? And I went down there and I pressed the call button and one of the elevators come down. And I went inside and I thought, well, where's the bank manager going to be? He's probably going to be on the top floor. So I just pressed the button for the top floor. And as the, <clears throat> the, the elevator went up, I just thought, this could open anywhere. It could be on a corridor or in a storeroom or a warehouse. I don't know. But it was like in a film. In fact, if you if you know the film <clears throat> Local Hero, it was out in 1983, it was Burt Lancaster, where one of the characters goes to see uh, Mr. Harper of Knox Oil and Gas in Texas, and Burt Lancaster is Mr. Harper. And, and, and it was like that. The lifts opened up into a palatial office, and facing the, the elevator door there was not one but two desks with two beautiful secretaries, and they were looking like at me, and I had my little blue cagoule on like a lost schoolboy. And I stepped out the lift and I said, I'm here to see the bank manager. And they looked at each other and one of them said to me, does Mr. What's his name, is he expecting you? And I said, I don't think so. So one of them went off <laughs> and the other one kept a nervous eye on me until <clears throat> her colleague came back and she said, Mr. So-and-so will see you now. <clears throat> so I thought, great. So I had my literal elevator pitch ready. I went in and I shook his hand and said, I'm Paul Doherty, I'm from Scotland. I'm here in Germany to work and learn the language. I need to open a bank account. I need some an advance. He went, Scotland. I love Scotland. So he sat me down at the table and he was talking to me about all his trips to Scotland. And as he did so, the 
one of the secretaries brought in coffee and cakes, and then he was asking me about my life. And, you know, he was he had all the time in the world, Robin. This guy had all the time in the world. In fact, I was on my second piece of cake, and he was still talking, right? And I thought, he's forgotten why I'm here. And he, he must have read my thoughts, read my mind, because he said, Mr. Doherty, so you're here, you've, you've got a job, you, you need to open a bank account, you need some money. Okay, so he phoned, picked up the telephone, phoned up a manager from the lobby, and he was speaking to him on the phone in German, but when the guy came in, he spoke to him in English so that I would understand, and he said, this is Mr. Doherty, he's going to open a bank account with us today, and you're going to give him 400 Deutschmarks as an advance on his salary. And he said, Mr. Doherty, good luck, and I hope you learn German, and I hope you have a good time in Germany. I could have hugged the guy, you know. And I went out past the beautiful secretaries and I could have kissed them, but I didn't, of course. I went into the, the elevator and this young manager, who wasn't much older than me, he waited for the doors to close and then he turned on me and he said, how dare you? How dare you go and see Mr. So-and-so? He's a very important man. He's very busy. You should have come and seen me or one of my colleagues. And I was just thinking, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I'd gone and seen you or one of your colleagues, I would not be walking out of here with 400 Deutschmarks. And as he counted the notes into my hand, I just thought of my friend and I thought, no, it's not going to be two weeks. It's going to be a little bit longer before you see me again. And so I was in Germany for a year. Then I repeated the whole thing in France a year later. I worked in Nice for a year. I met a beautiful Swedish girl in Nice, moved to Sweden and worked there for four years. Came back to London, 1986. And I was working as a typesetter in Fleet Street, which is where the newspapers were in those days. And I saw an advert in The Guardian for international company looking for foreigners who speak English. And I thought, well, as a Scotsman in London, I qualify as a foreigner and I can speak English. So I applied for it. It turned out to be Xerox. <clears throat> the guy who interviewed me, <clears throat> a guy called Mike Scott, he became my <clears throat> business partner later when we set up companies. And uh, he was saying, I oh, so he moved to Germany and learned German. Oh, I wish I'd done that. Oh, and then he moved to France and then Sweden. Oh, I wish I'd done that. So instead of it being negative, it was seen as something positive. And he offered me a job as a translation coordinator, a junior project manager in the Xerox in-house translation department in, in, in Welling Garden City in England. And that's how completely by accident I ended up in the translation industry. And I remember what the ex-CEO of Road Account, a guy... I got on really well with Rory. I think he's a great guy. But he used to call people like me international misfits. And, That's um, right. Yeah, <laughs> he said it in a very loving way. But I mean, I always thought, I always thought, I'm not. I'm, I'm a perfect fit for the localization. What would have been a misfit for me was would have been staying in Glasgow, working for a Glasgow firm, going for drinks on a Friday, talking about football on on a on a Monday. That would have been a real misfit. But for me, the localization industry is perfect fit for me. I love it. It's been great for me. So that's how I ended up in the localization industry. Excellent. Well, what a great story. And there's so many lessons in there to be learned. I mean, even on the sales side and your your courageous way of walking into the bank manager, you know, from a, from a sales perspective, sometimes we miss that opportunity. And there were so many lessons in there, like, don't be afraid if you believe in the cause, if you believe in the, in the, uh, passionately in, a, in something, don't be afraid of telling that story to anybody. Uh, it doesn't matter their ranks in any organization. And that's a great uh, segue to my next conversation, which I'd love to dig into it with you. Now that you are in the localization uh, industry by accident, uh, yeah. and, it was in, and as history proves itself down the road, it was a good accident. It was, you know, it, it was a great accident. Now, you started working for a company, but then somehow, somewhere, you decided to start your own company. And as I read your bio, somewhere, somehow, a demarcation in the line for your career, you thought, you know what, I'm going to start my own company. If you don't mind, walk us through that. So you work for Xerox, and something just happened, whatever that is, triggered you to open your own organization. How did that work? So, well, Xerox, it was a very exciting time to join them in 1987. And Xerox, at that time, I don't know what it's like now, but at that time, it was a great company. They invested in their employees, lots of training. I just felt for the first nine months, I was getting paid to learn things, you know. And and at the time that Xerox was investing a lot in machine translation, 
Uh, so they did all their service documentation by machine translation using Sistran, and uh, they had they had bought Altnet for the front end as you know, so they were in developing computer assisted translation to help with the translation of what became DocuTech, their flagship high volume printer, which had a touch screen user interface, and it was going to be translated into ten languages, including. Mm-hmm. You know, finish and and nobody knew how to, how to do it, so we had to work that out. And we just thought to ourselves after a number of years, you know, Xerox is great at innovating things, but they're not very good at marketing. So we thought there's an opportunity to to kind of offer these tools to the external market, and um, so we we set up uh, the Language Technology Centre. And we went after the automotive industry. And we were successful. We were too successful because we won the Ford Europe contract and the General Motors Europe contract. And Xerox thought, this is great, so we're going to keep keep this, whereas we had wanted them to spin it off. So instead of that, we spun ourselves off and we set up multilingual technology. And Xerox became one of our biggest customers. And so, and then we had seven years of running our own company and then we sold that to, to Berlitz in 2000. So, th- so I think, the the reason that we left Xerox and set up our own company is because there was no pressure from inside Xerox. Xerox was happy just developing things for their own use, and we were thinking, hey, there's a market out there we could sell this to. And lots of other companies that could benefit from this, and so it was that kind of focus on the outside world that prompted us to set up our own company. So for those who says, you know, those are the back you know, the, the good old days. And I see today, you know, similar opportunities, similar risks, similar environment altogether happening in our industry. For, those, for the naysayers out there, and I'm referring her here to how AI is taking over our, people say taking over our industry, which is not, I mean, there's a lot more debate on this one. Has the, you know, the good old days and the golden age of the translation is there such thing as a golden age? And I don't know the answer to that. And has these opportunities exist today in your mind? Do you feel like, you know, some people would say, well, nothing has changed. You know, we had opportunities back then. We have opportunities now. You know, the environment may be different. The situation may be different. But people with the right skills, with the right drive, can achieve their similar results as you did in the beginning of the uh, of your career. Am I correct or no? Uh- Two immediate points I say, number one, these are the good old days. Today is the good old days, right? That's right. And and two, people have been predicting the demise of the localization industry for the last 36 years. Right? That's right. <laughs> and it's still here. And I think it will still be here. But of course, it changes. Technology changes things. And there have been lots of improvements. One of the things I would say, you know, with a small company back 30 years ago, you could get an audience with a, a with with a Microsoft, which would be difficult to do if, with a small startup company today in localization. It'd have to be have some sort of tech story to it. But I think there are great opportunities. I mean, look at the the the, the industry, the business is expanding. There's lots of mergers and acquisitions going on. It's a bit quiet this year, but it's, you know, there's peaks and troughs, but it never goes away. I think there are loads of opportunities out there. It's not just that I think, you know, you go to, I went to Elia in Bled in May this year, and I met lots of entrepreneurs who are setting up companies. It's very, very dynamic. Mm -hmm. And so speaking of those potentials and those opportunities that people are developing and, you know, you know, capitalizing on uh, some of the experiences that you've been through when it comes to mergers and acquisition. I'd like you to talk a little bit about the impact of private equity firms, finances, regardless of private investors, et cetera, pulling money or putting money into our industry. And that has shifted over the years. And at the beginning of, you know, let's say in the 80s, there was not much firms money pouring in or private investors putting money into the industry. It was more like self-funded people starting up things on their own. Yeah. How did that change? How did that move around now that we have a little bit more liquidity, access to liquidity uh, in the industry, a lot more access to liquidity in the industry now than we had in the past? How did that impact the industry, positive or negative? 
I think <clears> the, <throat> the firms have had a positive impact because they see an industry that you know is ripe for consolidation and they see opportunities for efficiencies and to make money. And and I think that's true. But in order to to make those efficiencies and make those predicted improvements and 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 profits, you've got to do the integration of the two companies properly. Buying a company is easy, but you know, integrating them and successfully is hard work. And that's that's why, you know, five years ago I decided to focus on that area. How do you actually do how do you actually integrate two companies successfully so that they deliver the promised value of the deal? Because in, yep. in most, in most of my time I've I've you know I've seen a lot of these deals which look great on paper, they didn't deliver the promised value, which is very disappointing. So for you, when you and I'm glad you're making the segue and the jump to the integration piece. So but before we get into the integration piece, what makes a good the characteristics of a good deal? So I'm assuming cultural matches, financially needs to be viable, et cetera. But what is in your mind the recipe for a good deal plus the integration piece? Well, you know, the why why do most owners buy another company? It's for growth, you know. Growth cures a lot of ills if done properly. So <clears throat> if you look at the last company I worked for was Moravia before it was bought by, before it, before it was acquired. And they went from, from zero to 140 million euros organically, which is a great achievement. Moravia was a very cool company. But it took over 20 years to do that. And, and not, not every owner wants to wait that long. So the owners are under pressure for growth. Growth brings bigger customers. You can attract better talent. It gets you to where you want to get quicker if done properly. So that's the the main motivation for owners to want to do it. So what, what you need is obviously to choose the right company. But most, most owners are good at doing, doing due diligence. That's not where most of the problems lie. It lies after that. You, so you do your due diligence, you're chosen the right company. But all the things that you just mentioned there, like culture and cultural fit and, and you know, the behaviours and attitudes and the identity and the values, people think that's hippy-dippy rubbish, you know. They maybe think about it, well, yeah, that will take care of itself. All the people issues, they, they'll, they you know, we just tell people what to do and they'll go and do it. But that's, so they underestimate the human aspect of it. So, I mean, I talk about the seven deadly sins of of company mergers and acquisitions, but you could really boil that down to one uh, sin, which is you just underestimate the people aspect and how much planning and work is involved in, in keeping people on board and bringing them along with you, because without that, the deal is going to fail. And this is, uh, you know, you bring up a, a couple of a couple of points I'd like to comment on, uh, Paul, uh, since it's a chat, uh, you and I uh, tell people, like, imagine we're having a coffee chat. So consider it a coffee chat with me. So one of the things I, I talk about when it comes to organic growth, there are two aspects of it. One is if you're buying a company to buy revenue, you may want to consider the option of, you know, having other salespeople or more salespeople or improve your sales, your sales organization to get you that revenue and consider that, or at least contemplate it or assess it in a way. Yes. And the second thing when uh, buying companies uh, for growth, uh, generally you, you need a lot of things in place to have that in, in place to make sure that it is, it continues, make sure the customer stays with you, make sure the resources that they're specifically specialized in serving these customers stick around. As you mentioned earlier, uh, you can't just tell people, you tell customers, your project manager is no longer with us. I'm going to get you a new project manager. If they don't like that project manager, the customer takes their business somewhere else. It is very people and, and, and connected in that, in that regard. It is not the human, the human is not out of the equation. It is still, no. it with, we're still in, in play, still within the equation. Yeah. So, I mean, the human, so <clears throat> you need to have a compelling story. And not just, you know, me as an owner, this makes sense to me or it makes sense to the executive. You know, a lot of 
businesses to see why is this deal good for us as a company, right? But you've got to think is what does this mean for our customers? Why is it good for them? Because if you want your customers to stick around, it's got to be a compelling story for them as well. And then for your the employees of both the acquired company and the acquiring company, what does it mean for them? It's not just, you can't just say it's going to be growth or we're going into, we're going to have offices in China or Germany or whatever. What does that mean for them? What problems is that going to solve for them? Here's an opportunity to improve our processes. Here's a, an opportunity to upgrade the way we work. How, you know, is there going to be training opportunities for you as employees? There are going to be promotional opportunities. We're going to change the way we work. So you've got to find a really compelling story. And you've got to say things like, describe what success will look like. Hey, this is what we think this is combined company is going to look like 12 months from now. It's got to be a good story. And then rather than just describing it as something that's going to happen, you've got to involve your employees in that <clears> as well <throat> by saying, hey, this is a vision but we don't have all the answers. We're going to be yeah. looking for you to help us get there. And and then that kicks off a whole set of looking at what's going to deliver value, the key value drivers, yeah. those projects which are going to deliver uh, the biggest value in the shortest space of time to prove to everyone, hey, this was a great deal and not a, a colossal waste of time and money. Right. So, so you're engaging the employees, your great communication with the customers, Great com- communication is one of the reasons that that most of these deals fail because uh, there's in a typical company you've got this executive culture where we do all the hard thinking and then we make an announcement and then it's up to you to make it happen and that isn't going to work. So you've got yeah. and, and something as big and complex and disruptive as an acquisition integrating two companies. You've got to have the vision. The CEO has to have the vision saying, here's where what success looks like. Here's where we're going to go. But the CEO also has to have the humility to say, we don't know all the answers, but we're going to need your help to do it. And, and we're going to communicate with you. So if I think of, of examples, so like of t- companies I've worked with, with, you know, like Argus and Venga, their integration, both CEOs were absolutely visionary and they were on board you need your ceo to 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 recognize that this is something that's problematic unless we plan for it and deal with it and things are going to go wrong but with a plan we'll be able to manage the things that go wrong rather than just hoping that things will sort themselves out so i've seen i've seen this work i've seen it work yeah. but unfortunately i've seen it fail more often because people yep. underestimate what's involved in actually <clears throat> planning and implementing the first 12 months of the integration. So one of the things I want to go back to, you mentioned earlier, which is uh, struck a chord with me, is the uh, how long it took Moravia to get 140 million euros, um, which is about 20 years you mentioned earlier, and it, which, which, which brings me to a topic which is not much discussed in our industry. You know, we often see other industries around us and we try to automatically replicate or in our mind uh, think of our industry the same way as a, you know, a dot com or a dot com company that just, you know, formed a company and overnight became, you know, $50 million company because they created something that the entire world cannot live without. Our industry seems to be a longer, a longer, I want to say, from an organic growth perspective, it takes longer to grow an industry such as ours. And the expectation when you buy a company, especially depends on who buys it, obviously, is to you know buy it, hold it for five years and double its size, double its profit, and then maybe sell it. If that's your objective, I don't know. Some people, some companies, some, some investment firms will do that. However, if somebody buys it for the long term, for the long haul, and they've got a cultural view on the world and how they're going to put those two companies together, a more long term views, I think there'd be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more success because I have not really seen in, you know, I mean, um, maybe, maybe I'm not privy to all the <laughs> financials out there. I've not yet seen a company that organically within five years double its size. Now, people can tell me, oh, I took a company from 1 million to 2 million in five years. Well, good for you. Try to do mm-hmm. that when you're a $100 million company and double it within, the, within five years. It becomes mm-hmm. a lot harder. Mm-hmm. What, what do you think well, of that? 
I, I think investors, private e equity companies, they're not in it for the long haul. They're in it for the short term. You know, they, they always have an out. And that's fine, but in the time they're there, they can do a lot of good. And I like private equity companies because when I talk to them about integration, they're always looking for a way to, 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 to ensure that their investment is going to be successful. Whereas when I talk to, to some CEOs of localization companies, they think, eh, you know, I've done this before. I've got this under control. But when you look at the deals or you talk to their employees, you find out, you know, even when you ask them, if you say, okay, it's good that you've, you've had all this experience of buying companies, but, you know, if you could change just one thing about what happened in the last acquisition, what would you do differently? And they'll go through all the different things that I have in my seven deadly sins, you know. Oh, yeah, I mean, the communication <laughs> wasn't very good. Or, you know, it's sort of like we should have moved quicker, we moved too slow, and we should have integrated some of the core processes quickly, or we spent too much time doing things that weren't going to actually deliver the value. So, but whereas PE investors, their their ears are open to these kind of things because they know that they've got to they've got to get the, uh, a return very very quickly. So so long term and invest you know organic growth over long term. Well, Moravia they they were very clear how they were going to do it. They were going to focus on top five big companies, and then they were just going to give them so much attention, focus on them become indispensable for those companies. So most companies in the localization industry, they get 50% of the revenue from the top 10 customers, and then 50% of the revenue from hundreds of other cu customers. Moravia just decided we're not dealing with the with the long tail. We're just going to focus on these top five to 10 customers. And that was very successful because they became indispensable for these customers, and these customers were all high tech you know, Silicon Valley customers, and they are growing massively. So they piggyback their organic growth on the growth of their customers. It was a wonderful strategy, very successful. So uh, on on the same topic, Paul, um, what do you think? What do you think the during the uh, integration phase, from an advice perspective, for those who are contemplating uh, M and A out there? Can you speak to the topic of centralization versus leave it alone? To run the way it was running you bought something successful hopefully you did not buy a dead company you bought something successful uh you want to make sure that this success continue of course you're going to contribute with your management style your your know-how your technology etc but you want to leave some autonomy to what made them successful first or do you want to pull them into your core systems and make them all one unified company and there's a pros and cons to each model so can you speak to that i just think well why are you buying the company so some companies buy another company and then they start wondering, well, then they start asking the question, are we going to centralize it? Are we going to keep it decentralized? I think, well, why are you asking these questions now? Why are you buying this company? Surely you've thought about this before you buy the company. And then you come into it. Once the deal's signed, you've got a plan ready to go. Why do you start thinking about these things afterwards? I just don't understand that. But that's what happens a lot of the time. They just say, we'll buy it, it'll be good. And then they're thinking, oh, Core processes, which ones are we going to keep? Which ones are, are we going to have it decentralized or, or are we going to bring it all back into the states, you know, and just run it remotely? There's no right or wrong answer. I mean, but you have to work this out, you know, before before you you actually get too too far down the road in integration. So I would just say you to anyone, to, you got to have a plan, I, I right? Can't tell you, I can't tell you why you're buying this company, but when you tell me why you're buying it, I can help you put together a plan to deliver that. Absolutely, you got to have a plan before you before you embark on executing something. Very, very, very valid advice. Now, on the on the other side to your specialty, and that's after your long history in this industry and seeing so many things on the M and A, building companies, etc. Your specialty, my understanding today, is that. You deliver these services. You provide these types of services to people who are buying companies and selling companies, right? So can yeah. you speak to your services now and sort of the audience who are listening to this channel, if they are interested in what makes them a, an interesting party for you to be engaging with you? Where does in their process the need become, you know, say, hey, I'm at a point right now. I got to call Paul. What does that look like? Right. Well, <clears throat> So I, I've been through lots of M&A, 
And I, I've seen it done well and I've seen it done badly. And unfortunately, more often done badly. And that wasn't because the the, the leadership of the companies that acquired other companies were, 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 were foolish or weren't until they were very smart people. They just underestimated. They, they they thought the hard work was buying the company and then afterwards integration would take care of itself. And I say, no, the hard work starts when the deal is done. And therefore, I would say to anybody who's contemplating buying a, you know, who's in the due diligence phase or the letter of intent phase, it'd be a good t- time to talk to somebody like me to plan that integration. Because I, I, I normally don't feel, I find out about deals until they're made public. And by that time, it's too late because owners are, are 100% optimistic. It's like a gambler. Once they place the bet, they are the most confident that the horse is going to win. And so you can't go in and, and say, I think you should change your bet now. Likewise, when the owners buy another company, that day the deal signed, they're in celebratory mode. Don't talk to me about things that might go wrong, right? Then you talk to them a year later and they think, oh, God, if I'd only known, right? So I would say when you're in that letter of intent, due diligence stage, that's the time where I could you could involve someone like me because I look at these seven areas that cause integration to fail and I plan for how to avoid the pitfalls. The seven areas, you look at those areas and 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 you plan for them. And of course, things go wrong, but with the plan and with a team in place to manage that, then you can you can just ride out those challenges and deliver the deal, deliver the value of the deal in the first year. And I've seen that. I've got customers who can, who can talk to them and and say, yeah, this this I call this my company merger protocol. Just gave it a name so so people can <laughs> latch onto it. But it's basically looking at these seven areas and that that company merger protocol. It should be put in place that plan before the deal is done, so that when when the deal is done, you've got that plan ready to, to go full steam ahead on day one. Absolutely. And uh, you have a very good point. Plan ahead and, and you know, and have that conversation. It's all about minimizing risk, isn't it? Uh, you're right. You mentioned earlier, there's no nothing guaranteed in life, especially in those complex deals where you have many moving pieces. The idea of minimizing risks, I guess that would be an interesting discussion for investors and people who are putting their money on the line on this one. So Absolutely. So, I mean, that's... That's why we say to, to PE investors, you know, when you're when you're doing all your hard work and your due diligence, just do a little bit more hard work in planning the integration. Because that's Correct. what's that's what's going to secure the return on your investment. And and my last, you know, uh question on this particular topic is what do you think of the branding uh, of the two organizations that they're merging together? Uh have you ever thought of that? I have a uh, panel discussion coming up. Uh, on branding. I already did one, but I got another one uh, on rebranding or branding in general. Would you, have you seen it kept, I mean, I'm sure companies kept their brands after the M&A, but what would be the benefit or the negatives or not so much benefit from merging the two names into one or not merging them? Well, well, sometimes the, 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 I've seen companies buy a speciality company and that brand really kind of resonates for that speciality area, you know, LQA or something like that, or, you know, SEL bought Trados, so they kept the Trados name, that kind of thing, right? Then they called it SEL Trados. So there might be good reasons for keeping a name, but most of the time it's like they buy the company and then they think, oh, are we going to keep the name? Are we going to keep that name? Or are we going to... After the deal is done, it's kind of like, why haven't you thought about this before? <laughs> Why don't you have a plan? <laughs> this is what we're going to do, and you can announce it. We're going to we're going to call it Brand X because Brand X is buying Brand Y. So you guys, Brand Y, you're going to become Brand X, right? Why not just decide that and have a plan for doing that? Why does it become a discussion point after the deal is done? Unfortunately, that happens quite a lot. You know, these things could all be planned in advance, and that's. You know, if, if you know somebody like me, that that would I would prompt those kind of discussions. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm assuming, Paul, you will help these companies go, go through these thought process of evaluating branding and, you know, and the positioning and all that stuff. Well, you know, I, I, I talk to owners about what, why are you doing this deal? What does success look like? Right. You know, what is, 
what is the value that you're, why are you doing this? You know, what's the value you want to deliver? And out of that then comes all the, then what are the, what are the things you have to do now in the first 12 months, which is going to deliver that, that, yep. Yep. that value. And, you know, it's just kind of basic stuff like that, but then you put in a plan and, you know, it also gets rid of all the other <clears throat> extraneous things. See, quite often when you buy another company, everybody wants to do everything at once, right? Some owners sure. get, oh, the deal's done. We'll take our foot off the gas. We'll do nothing. We're not going to decide anything just now. And they think, well, people are expecting you to do something just now. And then other ones want to do everything. And I say, well, you know, there's you've got to separate out the key value drivers. What's going to deliver the promised sure. value of the deal in the shortest possible time? And that focuses minds. And if you do that... Sure then you're going to have a successful integration. And you're going to be Excellent. saying in years' time, this is glad we did this. Yeah, instead of regretting it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the opposite feeling is not so good. Um, no, exactly. I really appreciate yeah. So just before we close off here, Paul, I know we're coming up on the number of, on the on the hour here. I just want to make sure that we cover everything. Any... You, you can still hear me, right? I can still hear you. Yeah, so any uh, last uh, comments uh, uh, you would like to convey to our audience in terms of you know, how to reach you, what do you like them to do next, etc.? Well, if, it, if anyone looks at my LinkedIn page, there's lots of explainer videos there. I, I do posts every Monday morning on m and and culture, all the seven areas, culture change, the CEO's role, all, all the things that go wrong. I, I post things which, uh, if, if people read them, they'll see two, two things. They might learn something they didn't know. And secondly, they might think, I know what I'm talking about. And so you can have a look at that. And then if you are in that letter of intent, due diligence stage, have a chat with me. And I'll, I'll yeah. you know, um, so, so that you don't end up like, the vast majority of business owners who after the deal's done, then they start thinking, oh, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about that? Have you thought about that? I, they can avoid all that. I invite all of our audience to have a chat with Paul Doherty. You can look him up on LinkedIn. And as you can tell from this conversation, Paul is not a hard person to have a conversation with, is an easy person to have a conversation with. I personally feel this it, almost uh, 45 minutes, an hour here went like a blink. And like, I feel like we want to talk more. I want to talk more. I would love to invite you for the next topic. Maybe we'll have a more precise topic to dive into, Paul, and maybe bring some Thanks, knowledge, some knowledge to the industry about specific M&A related conversation. That would be great. Thank but you. in the meantime, I want to thank you so much for joining me this, today on this, on this recording of this episode. And uh, I look forward for a future conversation with you, Paul. And also, I want to thank our audience for listening in. And this is Robin Ayub signing off from Marbella, Spain. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Localization Fireside Chat. Take the warmth of knowledge and renewed cultural passion with you. Keep exploring. Stay curious. And until next time, this is Robin Ayub. Keep those global conversations alive.